allowing yourself to create something custom is you're, you're able to give your brand a voice and where beer can't go, a t-shirt can. Welcome to Building Bellingham. I'm your host, Leo Cohen. Season two is starting off a little different than season one. We're not in the studio and our conversations are live streamed onto the Building Bellingham Facebook page before they make their way here. We're a little rougher around the edges, but the core is the same. Honest conversations with local entrepreneurs talking about challenges, failures, and the effort it takes to build a successful business. Join me as we dive into the story behind one of Bellingham's biggest brands. Leo, super excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, amped to share my journey with you. Uh, my name is Brendan. I'm the CEO of Briss Manufacturing. Briss is a private label merchandise manufacturer that offers its customers an end-to-end -end merchandise management experience. In short, we provide our customers all the necessary tools to design, manufacture, and distribute custom brand empowering merchandise. We work with thousands of customers all throughout the country, making millions and millions of custom garments on an annual basis. And you may unknowingly have a few of them in your closet. Brendan, what's up, man? Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Brendan Pape here with Brist MFG Manufacturing, located here in Bellingham. I mean, this is about as grassroots as it gets, right? Pretty much neighbors, man. Tell me yep. a little bit about who you are, where you came from. How did you end up in Bellingham with this uh, manufacturing empire up here? So I was born in Seattle area. I lived there until about the fifth grade. My mom and stepdad, we moved out to Minneapolis. So I lived in uh, Minneapolis um, through high school. I knew that I wanted to get back out to the West Coast. So I came out here and went to Western Washington University and got my undergrad. And that's kind of where it all started. Um, my uh, past business partner and I, we started a clothing brand called Decidual, our junior year of college. And, you know, the rest of this kind of history for the last 10 years, I've been owning and managing my own business. And Brist uh, was a, a big pivot off of uh, that clothing brand. And you guys were at the the bookstore, the Western bookstore. I remember when I was at Western seeing your clothing everywhere in there. Yeah, that they gave us the, our, our big start, man. Um, so the goal with the behind the clothing company was ultimately we just wanted to be creative and, and sell shirts to our friends. It was, it was ultimately just supposed to be a, a hobby. You know, when it comes to making making T-shirts, the barrier of entry is pretty low. low. So we're like, oh, we can do this. So we went and, you know, scrounged up some cash and uh, bought all, a bunch of equipment on Craigslist and set up shop in my bedroom. Definitely lost the girlfriend after that move. <laughs> um, so the business kind of took over and um, our first kind of big break was getting our clothes in the Western bookstore. And I remember going in there um, with an invoice that was uh, written on a Word document. Cheryl from the Western bookstore, she is an absolute saint. She's like, you should intern here. I need to teach you some things. And um, so that was kind of like the big break point uh, for us. Uh, we sold a ton of merchandise that, that really helped us kind of propel the business forward, reinvest, and ultimately uh, open up new opportunities. And you're a couple of college kids at this point, you're going through school. So you, where did this idea come from? I mean, was it just, you had some extra time or did you, did you just see shirts that and you thought we could do that? We're creative. We have the same mindset. How do like, yeah, I mean, it was just an idea that um, came from out of the classroom. We're like, Oh, we should start a clothing brand. And we're like, Oh yeah, let's do it. And we actually took a, uh, took our, you know, our step forward and, and bought the equipment and kind of dove right in. I mean, and we found the time uh, in between school and everything. We made time for it. And I mean, that was kind of like our job. Granted, we weren't making any money. It was kind of like a volunteer job. And I remember, you know, graduating college. And that was like when I had to make that big decision. Do I go yeah. into the corporate world or do I figure out how to make this work? And um, I think that was the biggest challenging. I think one of the most challenging points for, uh, Christian and I at the time was making that decision, like, hey, let's try to make this work. And at the time we were making no money, zero dollars. My mom's like, what are you doing? You have, you know, a ton of student debt. This is not a good idea. Um, you don't even have enough money to support yourself after graduation. So what I had, what I did was I walked the docks, the Bellingham docks, to try to find a fishing job. I went down there every morning with donuts, couldn't tie a knot to save my life. And uh, I was fortunate enough <laughs> to score a landed job on a fishing boat for three months 
came back with a, a decent chunk of change, which bought me time. We we clawed and scratched and and bootstrapped our way, and we finally got it to the point where, you know, we were able to support ourselves, which was pretty so exciting. One of the things that I hear from other generations too, complaining about our generation is that we we have this sense of entitlement. But you guys said, well, this is what we want to do. I don't want to go work for somebody else, and I just need to figure out how to get the cash to do this. Tell me about your mindset at that point saying, okay, well, I don't really know how to get cash besides just going and getting a job working for somebody else or going on a fishing boat. How did you make that commitment? How did you just decide that you were going to commit to, I need to make this amount of money. I'm just going to stay committed. I'm not going to get distracted. I'm just going to do it because this is what we want to do. No wasn't an option. I think at that point, you know, we were coming out of, I think we, no wasn't an option. We wanted to prove, you know, people wrong. I think, you know, starting a, a clothing company is, is kind of like the typical, you know, business that a lot of people start. And I think there's a lot of people that were like, oh, this isn't going to work. And, you know, we were both very tenacious, you know, individuals and, and we were committed to, to making it work. And uh, neither of us were privileged. You know, we didn't have, you know, financial support beforehand and we didn't, you know, set ourselves up to have, you know, a good chunk of change because we were thinking around doing this throughout college. Um, but we lived super meagerly. We busted ass, you know, we just paid ourselves the bare minimum to be able to survive the bare, bare minimum. And then everything else was invested back into the company so we could continue to grow. And I think that was the key to our success is we were so diligent about not taking a cent for the first, you know, few years, you know, looking back on it, it was super challenging, you know, that's, and that's kind of why, why, you know, another big reason why I came out with more student loans than I probably should have is I was <laughs> kind of paying myself in student loans to survive yeah. for about three years there. So, so you're keeping this ember going and <laughs> You know, one of the things that I, I haven't learned until the last five or six years of my life is like this whole concept of how do you acquire customers? Obviously it's building a relationship and that's really the true term, but you guys were ultimately started out with decidual doing straight to consumer, direct to consumer, right? Yeah. So for decidual, we would go to every single event, any outdoor event, we were there with a the booth. Um, we would give out free stickers galore. I mean, we didn't have a marketing budget. So we're like, what's the cheapest thing to give out that people will be stoked on? And it was stickers. And then the next thing you know, you had all of like Bellingham, Washington with, you know, a decidual sticker on their car. And, you know, we've had probably only sold a, you know, 24, 48 shirts at the time. But then people started wondering, like, what the heck is this company that I continue to see around town? And I think that's what really helped elevate and, and kind of put us on the map. In addition to the Western Bookstore, um, some of those shirts that we were selling in the Western Bookstore were... I think that the, the uh, Cheryl from the Western bookstore, the buyer there, she compared it to like the Beanie, Beanie Baby craze. If everyone <laughs> had one of those neon green Washington ground t-shirts, they were everywhere. That helped out a ton. We had a, you know, a ton of good friends too in the outdoor space that were, you know, amateur or professional athletes that helped put us on the map as well. Um, so just networking. So interesting. So you're, you're, you're starting from basically nothing on this. You're acquiring mm -hmm. customers because you basically put out brand. You just put your brand out there. Did yeah. you know that that was a strategy or did, was that just the first thing that popped into your head that you're like, well, let's just get the brand everywhere and get everyone wondering what it is. That, I, I think we kind of knew that, you know, that we got to put it on the map somehow and we can't buy all this inventory to put it on the map. So what is the cheapest thing? you know, to do? What is that thing that's going to stick with people? No pun intended. And it was like a sticker. Yep. And we yep. got thousands and thousands and thousands of stickers made and we just came out for free. We were always on um, up at, you know, Bender's row, row. We'd go down to Seattle and go to snowboard premieres. So we we're definitely, you know, super focused on, you know, North of Seattle area at, yep. at the beginning. And, yeah. and when you're, when you're doing any sort of apparel brand, I mean, I've <clears> seen it many, many times where, inventory is always the big, it's kind of the pain point, right? How do you buy too much? Do you buy too little? How do you do this? So when you guys were starting out and didn't have as much cash on hand, because the business, you're putting everything back into the business, making sure that fire keeps going. How did you guys gauge how much inventory to buy? What were you doing to track your metrics to be able to really ensure that you have the right amount of inventory on? This question kind of leads to how we, you know, began setting the foundation for Brist, but, but originally we would try to kind of like make the order, but when it came to like super custom stuff, like stuff that is like super unique, you know, it's not just, you know, a product that you can go get embroidered down the street or a t-shirt that you can print on. That was the stuff that was challenging to gauge because 
going overseas and creating something custom, that's when you open up yourself to being stuck with a ton of inventory. And that's how we kind of began setting the foundation for Brist is we were at this point um, in Decidual where we were tired of just making simple screen printed t-shirts. We were tired of making, you know, just simple embroidered hats. We wanted to do more custom products that you would find in an REI or a Nordstrom or your favorite, you know, snowboard shop. It was super, super unique apparel. And the only way to really do that at the time was to be, you know, a super large corporation that had awesome supply chains because suppliers overseas, they make their money on a volume large, large orders, like a thousand pieces of a style and a color, you know, 5,000 pieces of a style and a color. And we're this, you know, super small, co you know, company that, you know, has a hard time selling, you know, 72 shirts of a single style. That's, that's kind of where we had a hard time. And that's how we set kind of set the foundation for Brist is we wanted to challenge that that way of thinking in the manufacturing space. And, um, and to do that, to try to take a step in creating more custom apparel for the sigil at the time, we flew to China kind of off, off the cuff and met with probably a dozen or so random suppliers. And we had these huge presentations that we brought to them on like the importance of, you know, low minimums and quick turn times and how, you know, if they would service these smaller smaller businesses, small businesses and mid-sized businesses make up a huge chunk, you know, of the population that they would get that, you know, get that volume back. And, um, and ultimately, you know, they, they kind of looked at, a lot of them looked at us and laughed and were like, you need to get the heck out of here. Totally just stole my time. And a few of them gave us, you know, a shot. And those are the ones, you know, a lot of those uh, ones we still work with today, but, you know, beginning custom products, we had a hard time gauging the inventory. I remember we, you know, bought like our first custom, custom product, I think we had to get 500 of. It was like a custom fleece jacket and we had it for like three, in inventory for three years. I was like, oh. dang. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was a hard sell. For people that don't know a whole lot about inventory, that is your cash yeah. sitting on the shelf and not going where it needs to be. And that's, I mean, mm -hmm. that's stressful. So, you, I mean, what I'm hearing, the cool part about this pivot, this transition point in your world was that it was, and it's, you know, this is part of your, you know, mission statement, how Brist was created was it was created out of necessity. You guys hit this pain point and you're like, okay, we can't be the only ones that are going through this pain point. Because like you said, there's so much of the market that's made up of like small to mid-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. And so is, is that how Brist was created? It was out of necessity for this, like this target market that wasn't being serviced in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we originally solved the problem for ourselves. And then we realized that this, you know, this solution could be applied to many other businesses and to support Decidual, you know, at the beginning, the, the clothing brand, we started making things for other businesses and organizations, you know, so we could inject Decidual with cash and continue to expand and buy new products. And then it got to the point where we were making so much more stuff for other people, other businesses and brands that we were like, we need to put this drill on the back burner and take a full pivot and focus on how we can continue to provide businesses and organizations with all the necessary tools to create custom branded merchandise. And that is that happened in 2015, and we haven't looked back since. Who were your first customers when you made that pivot? I mean, the Seattle Mariners came pretty early. Aslan Brewery, you know, out of Bellingham, they were one from the beginning. Western... Yeah, we've worked with Young Life, um, all sorts of outdoor companies. Teton Gravity was a pretty early one as well. You know, they, they were kind of all with us from the beginning and and helping us kind of figure out the program and, and how it worked. Yeah, it, it was pretty exciting to see. And, and the organizations that we work with today, it's it's I wouldn't have ever imagined making, you know, apparel for some of these organizations if you would have asked me five years ago. 99.9% .9 of people don't know that we made that apparel because it's hundred percent supposed to be private labeled for them. So these are, I mean, you, you just mentioned some huge local businesses and some huge regional and national businesses, Sundance out there too. There's the Mariners, Aslan's a huge local brand. How did these, how did these meetings transpire? How did you, did you already have these connections through other avenues or did you just go in there and say, all right, I'm here. This is what we're looking to do. And they follow the vision or did they say no? What, what happened? Some, um, some are good friends like Aslan. Those guys have been friends from the beginning. So they gave us a chance and I think they, they understood the vision and what we were going for, which was awesome. And then others, uh, you know, for the longest time, me and uh, a colleague, we would just drive, you know, all throughout the West coast and go into businesses and pitch 
the business. We'd sleep on friends' couches. And a lot of people love the vision. They're like, what do you mean? You, you can make me a custom product from scratch with my brand on it. So I don't just have to have that typical embroidered hat. Like I can create my own unique identity. And we're like, yeah, we can do that. That's kind of how it all began. And it was super, I mean, it's still super, super fun, but you know, it's, it, it's interesting in like the early, early days, you know, you're, you're walking into meetings with some, some big, big customers and you're kind of faking it until you make it. You're like, oh man, are we going to be able to do this? And um, you know, throughout the process, I think, you know, we were confident in being able to figure it out if we didn't know how to do it at the time. Yeah. That, and that fake it till you make it term is, is so interesting because some people fake it till they make it, but what, what, just knowing you and how this business has grown at such a high quality, mm-hmm. it's more like betting on yourself, right? You're like at the start, you you have to bet more on yourself as a person. And then at some point you get systems and, and processes in place to make it a little bit more leveraged and automated. Tell me mm-hmm. a little bit about betting on yourself. Have you always been someone that's bet on yourself or is that something that you've developed over time? I don't think I've always been that, that person. I think um, when it comes to business, Yes. Especially, you know, if I'm going to say something to a customer, it's like, I'm not going to walk out of that room and not deliver. You know, I think it's, it's, it's not just the organization's name that's, you know, attached to whatever that commitment is, but it's, it's mine. And, um, you know, I think highly of, you know, my integrity as well as the organizations we were, we believed in, you know, in, in our mission and our goal. And, and we were willing to, you know, bet on ourselves at all costs. And we would, we didn't take no for an answer. And, you know, if we said we could do something, we, we figured it out and would follow through. And that doesn't mean it wasn't, it wasn't hard there. I mean, there's so many instances that were super challenging. I remember in 2019, I spent three and a half weeks in China, um, because we had this massive deal with a huge corporate organization out of Seattle and it hadn't, and it wasn't anything that we, we had done before, not that we weren't confident in doing it. We just hadn't done it before. So we wanted to take, you know, the uh, proper precautions to make sure that it was done correctly. And, you know, I was in China, you know, making sure that, you know, we were facilitating everything and it was going to go as planned. You know, at the time we hadn't, hadn't done a project of that caliber but we were confident that we could execute it. And uh, I think that's what's so awesome about, you know, our team is they're extremely resourceful and uh, they show a lot of grit and they're very solution oriented. You know, usually we have those conversations before we commit saying, hey, can we can we do this or is this a long shot? But we have been able to accomplish and do things that I never ever would have even thought about even just a few years ago. Yeah, absolutely. It keeps evolving. And um, totally. so th- there's, this, there's this pivot point where you guys created Brist out of necessity because it, it, it just was naturally magnetizing in that direction, right? I think a lot of the times what we hear is that, oh, it was all good. We just, we went for it. There was no, you know, fear around it. But one of the things that I like to talk about is fear. It's still a major pivot. I mean, you're, 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 it might be a very um, on par, like similar industry, but it's very different, right? You're changing your business. Tell me about the fear around a pivot and, and how big was your team? Did you guys you know, did you have to get everyone on board or was it just you and a couple of people that? Yeah, I think at the time it was like eight of us. So uh, the majority of us were on board. What made that pivot easier is the financials. It was a financially sound decision. It, um, the economics, you know, completely penciled out at that time we were making, you know, so much more product for other people that we were just diluting our focus and diluting, I think our opportunity for success because we were focusing on the sigil, which was the brand at the time that wasn't showing a ton of success. And so we were, you know, so focused on that, that we, you know, I think we, we probably should have made that pivot a little bit earlier because it's, you know, we were crushing it on the custom manufacturing, you know, standpoint, but the brand, it was, it was kind of flat for the majority of its, the majority of its of its life but that was kind of the ultimate goal and the dream that we really held on to and then you know one day it's like hey it's time to confront the you know the brutal facts and you know if we take this off our plate and we focus here i think we can create like a bomber you know business that is going to be you know built to last hey it's leo we'll be back to the interview in a moment but if you're new to the building bellingham podcast i wanted to say hello i'm a local real estate agent with the cohen group northwest powered by the moyoke group realtors We do real estate differently, and this community podcast is part of it. Check us out by searching Cohen Group NW on your favorite social media platform. And thank you for listening. And now, back to the show. And so you said there's about eight people. So tell me a little little bit about the roles at that time. So it was you, and then who else was on your team? Yeah, so it was was me. I had a business partner at the time. We had uh, 
Carson, who's been uh, our first designer. He's still with us today. He is an absolute rock star, incredible designer. So he was there. We had, I think, a couple um, a couple team members that were a part of kind of like the production aspect. We had an intern at the time. Uh, her name was Olivia. She's with us today. She runs our e-commerce program. We had, uh, I think, like, a, like one, sa- one sales rep. Aaron, who, who might come back and, and join us. He, he took a hiatus to Seattle and might be joining us again, which is exciting. So it was, it was a pretty small team. So production, design, and sales is pretty much kind of what it made, was made up of. Do you think at that time you were overstructured or understructured for what ensued after that? Because I, I mean, these bigger conversations or was it was it just something where you're like, all right, we're gonna just take it one step at a time. If we need to grow, we'll grow. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, we've started this. The the next step after that, yeah, we definitely were. We were we were underprepared. Uh, we weren't structured. And shortly after, you know, we did make that pivot. We got a we got a pretty big PO, and I a good friend from college lent us fifty thousand dollars to cover that PO. Yeah, and then after that, we really started focusing on building the foundation and what it would take to be able to support the business that we were trying to create. And uh, you know, when you, when you look at Brits today, it's we almost have like four individual businesses, and we we have evolved a lot. But at the time, it was um, we were trying to do a lot. We were trying to do a lot with a super small team. One of the things you mentioned was you were challenging the norm of manufacturing, right? Mm-hmm. Apparel manufacturing. Typically, like the, the the you know the companies that you had gone and pitched about supplying decidual were like you need a minimum of thou- of a thousand. What was your vision for challenging those norms? Because it's, you're, you're very clearly unique in what you do, which is why companies work with you. In challenging that, because we couldn't be successful without doing that. So in order to make decidual successful, we needed, you know, supplier relations that would focus on low, low minimums. We needed to have, you know, the tool belt to create custom apparel, to distribute custom apparel, to design custom apparel. When it comes to creating you know, just screen printed t-shirts when it comes to creating a full suite and providing an organization, all the necessary tools to create custom merchandise, you need a hefty infrastructure and you need a supply chain that can support it. And in order to support the customer segment that we were targeting, we needed suppliers that understood the importance of low minimums and quick turn times. So, so you weren't, it, it didn't just fall into place. You had to make all of these relationships on the back end for show those people the vision and then be able to go and, and, say and help and communicate, transfer energy to people and say, this is what we're doing. And yep. we have this backing now. So there's so much building ahead of time, it sounds like, to be able to go talk to your first customer. Totally. Yeah. And we and, and that's that was kind of like uh, how we build this sigil, I guess, out of, out of the beginning. When I mentioned going to China, you know, that's where we really presented the vision and the idea for for the sigil that ultimately kind of bled into what Brist is today and that foundation. So it was getting, you know, the back end, um, all those suppliers on board. And then after that, it was communicating to our customers what the heck we were doing. And a lot of them, you know, for the longest time and still today, can't quite wrap their head around. What is it that you actually do? Because we do, do, uh, you know, quite a bit of stuff. So, and how do you communicate that? Because it's when you, when you have something that's different, when you have something that's proven on many different levels, you know, to like, let's let's say the the mass producing uh, scale, that's easy to communicate. Hey, this is proven, this works. And you're creating this new market, right? How, how do you go and talk to the buyer at the Mariners or, or Jack over at Aslan? Or how do you communicate that to them and, 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 and help them understand that if they're truly asking, what, how, does this, how does this work? How, how do you do this? We had to show them. So yeah. we had to bring samples. We had to show them. We had to present. I mean, to this day, you know, the reason why we've got a lot of our biggest customers is because we put these comprehensive proposals in front of them that really want to explain what we do. And it shows there, basically we put together pitch decks that are, it's an art art portfolio that shows uh, an entire organization's line and what we could do for them if they were to work with Brist. And I think them being able to see that and see, you know, how their brand can be portrayed on custom apparel, you know, speaks volumes. And that is ultimately, I think, what really helped us communicate what we were doing to our customers and then showing them what we had done in the past with other customers. And, and even like the first couple, you, you're you just like, look, I'm you're betting on me and our team. Yeah. Right. And then it became, OK, we have one in our portfolio. OK, we have 10 in our portfolio. And all of a sudden it's like it, it becomes easier. Right. 
Exactly. Exactly. And we just took, you know, we, we continued to take the successes and show them to, you know, different customers. And that was like the testament that, Hey, this is, this does work. You know, we, we have proof, you know, here's testimonies, here's products, here's case studies, um, which really helped, you know, us validate one, what we were doing, and then also prove to the customers and give them the confidence that what we were doing was, was going to work and that we were going to help them create, you know, a successful apparel program that was either going to elevate their brands, you know, open up a new additional channel of revenue, help them, you know, better market and target, you know, different customers and so forth. I didn't realize how much of just at, at breweries as an example, how much merch actually, you know, is part of their revenue. Like I, I just didn't realize that. And how, how did you, was that something that was, has changed over the last 10 years or is that something that's always been a huge proponent or component of, uh, you know, a brewery or a restaurant? Craft breweries for sure. I mean, that was the first customer segments that we really worked within was the craft breweries. And it's crazy, you know, um, the amount of loyalty that communities show and you, you want to, and I think that's like the power of apparel. You know, we all wear what we are proud of. We wear what we like, you know? So if I go into a brewery and I, I like this brewery and it's, you know, in my hometown and I'm excited about their logo and I'm excited about what they're doing, I want to wear, you know, a shirt because that's something that aligns with, you know, my values, my interests, what I like. It's nuts how much, you know, beverage companies, how much merchandise beverage com- companies can sell. I mean, I feel like you can't walk into a grocery store without seeing some sort of, you know, brewery hat or t-shirt on on somebody. And I, and I think the same goes for, you know, many other industries. I think allowing yourself to create something custom is uh, you're, you're able to give your brand a voice and where beer can't go, a t-shirt can. I think the power of branding is the more you see something, the more you can gain trust in whatever that thing is. It's similar to kind of the, you know, how we tried to market to sigil. It was stickers. And the more people saw those stickers, the more they were interested in what it was. And each one of those stickers created an interaction, which created a memory with whomever that person was. And that's, and the same goes with apparel. And what's cool about apparel is you're a walking billboard. You're influencing people. Every time you wear something, it's a reflection of you and it's a reflection you know, of, uh, of the brand and, you know, it gets the brand on the map. I think apparel is, is super critical. One of the interesting things is you went from a brand, you're still a brand, but you went from a, a forefront brand, you know, to the customer, you know, mm-hmm. B2C to helping and basically consulting these businesses on customizing their brand and, and brand's super important. What's, tell me a little bit more about your vision on brand and how you consult people as they come to you. Um, as potential customers. The story that resonates with me about about brand, and it was kind of an uh, epiphany that I had uh, when we were creating Brist and uh, pivoting from Decidual to Brist, but I was at an outdoor trade show. And at this trade show, you have all the biggest brands that you know everyone aspires to work for. Uh, everybody really looks up to from North Face to Patagonia to GoPro. And um, you're walking around this trade show you'll see garbage cans completely filled up with merchandise, branded merchandise from these organizations. I remember seeing that. And I re- remember thinking, I was like, this is discrediting these brands. And these brands are putting their name on these products. And these products are simply not a reflection of these brand, whether it's whether or not it's poor design or poor quality. And I think that's, you know, one of the biggest things that we try to, you know, tell our customers. The last thing that we want to do is create something that's going to throw, get thrown away. The last thing that you want to do as a brand owner is give something to someone, to someone that they're not going to appreciate or value. And, uh, you know, that's been, uh, you know, one of our big missions from, from day one is to help organizations elevate, you know, their brand through the power of apparel. And in order to do that, you got to be thinking about quality. You got to be thinking about your consumer and what they like. And if, if your goal is to, you know, get just quantity out there uh, of, a, of a cheap product, you need to understand you're just burning your, your marketing dollars. You know, whatever you're going to put your logo on, it needs to align with your primary objective and your primary product. You, you create this, this niche market, right? For small, middle size, and obviously there's bigger brands that are, that are now working with you as well. How did you, what did you adjust to make the numbers work when you're in this niche market? That, that is a great question. And that's something that, you know, we're continuing to evolve today. Seeing how originally our model was to serve small businesses, we weren't making, you know, super large volume. So we had to work really hard at negotiating, you know, our costs with the factory and help them understand, hey, you know, we may order this hat, this hat right here in 72 pieces, but we're going to order, you know, on the year 80,000 
of this style from you um, to try to get, you know, better qu quantity discounts. But that that is something that, you know, we're working on right now um, is is understanding our customer segments, what, what products are mo most profitable, profitable, and, you know, expanding uh, those product categories. Um, all in all, I think for, uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, we've had a pretty healthy margin. Um, one thing that, you know, we did get a pretty big margin hit a, a couple of years ago with the tariff increases. We saw a pretty big hit to, um, you know, our bottom line because of that. But we've worked hard on, you know, trying to find efficiencies to make, you know, cut down our costs. And uh, we've worked really hard at negotiating, you know, our raw costs with our suppliers. And we do a lot of things in-house. So we do commercial grade screen printing in-house, which, you know, allows us to control our costs and to try to create, you know, efficiencies so we can, you know, maximize our output. And um, that's helped. That's helped as well. At this point, let's let's go back to that, the 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 famous eight, the legendary eight, when you pivoted and you have this 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 smaller team and you're you're talking about scaling and you're talking about you know screen printing machines. You, you probably had already had a, a pretty sizable inventory of machines that you needed, but if you're going to scale, not only did you need more help as far as leverage goes, more, more people, but also you probably, I don't know how much screen printing machines cost. I'm sure they're not cheap, but tell me about these moments where you're like, you're taking this leap of faith and saying, okay, we're going to buy this $50,000 fill in the blank. What was that scaling process like between people and machine? It was, um, yeah, that, I mean, that came down to understanding our output, you know, what we needed to uh, be able to do on a regular basis to keep up with, with the demand. And um, we started, we started super small, like we had a, a manual press out the gate. And then I remember we bought our first automatic press. I think it was, it was such an old, dirty machine. It was, I think, $25,000. We were so excited, super worried though. We we're like, gosh, man, this better increase our output. <laughs> this better work. The guy that came to set it up lived in his van. He had like a cat <laughs> with him. It was so bizarre, but that was our first press. And um, that really showed us the power of efficiencies and that, you know, equipment can really help create, you know, strong efficiencies and really increase your, you know, our output. And then after that, uh, we bought, you know, a new press and now we have a handful of, of new presses. We, we, we bought some sizable equipment this last year, uh, automatic like poly bagger. And now those decisions, you know, they're a lot more easy to digest because you can, you know, run the numbers and understand, you know, it's going to get paid off in this amount of time. You know, this is how much more efficient it is uh, now than it was before. But at the time, you know, being young and not full, fully understanding, you know, everything, it was, it was always a super long discussion. And um, I think what also made things, you know, a lot easier was we didn't take out any loans. Um, we took out a super small equipment loan. We heavily reinvested back into the business. And I think we were both kind of scared of debt at the time. We wanted to be in control of our destiny. We didn't want to borrow any, any money. Now, you know, I understand obviously the importance, you know, of that. And, but back then, it, you know, we paid pretty much paid for everything with cash. How did you gauge that before? And how do you look at it now? And, and what are some things that you might, you might finance versus pay cash for now knowing that a lot more of your systems and processes are, are proven. I think you need, you need cash to grow. And I think that's the biggest thing. Um, you, you gotta have, you gotta have cash to grow. And I think because of that financing equipment uh, is obviously the necessary, necessary way to go as uh, if you want to have a solid, you know, a more rapid growth trajectory, at least for us. I think that's, that's kind of like one of the biggest things we'll, we'll finance things now opposed to, you know, pay, paying for cash because we, you know, we want to keep as much liquid as possible so we can put it into, you know, hiring and experienced employees and other growth opportunities and in stuff like that. Cash is king. Tell me about failure, because that's a huge thing that I think a lot of people project that they don't have. It, it's, it's a very vulnerable thing to talk about. Some people see them as the end of the road and it's ruining, ruin, ruins their world. And other people look at that as a, as a red light that turns to a green light. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about, let, tell me about some of your, your, your favorite failures throughout your, your, oh, your, your journey. Failure is the essence of learning, right? I mean, without without failing, I feel like you can't learn. Uh, we've had so many, you know, shortcomings from, you know, trusting suppliers that weren't necessarily trustworthy. And next thing you know, we have thousands of dollars in products that are unsellable to, 
Yeah, just I mean, we, we had our fair share of problems from like a like a supplier front and and then sometimes biting off too much, you know, that we can handle and, you know, not fulfilling, you know, an opportunity in like a, a timely fashion. I think leadership wise, you know, I think I'm continuing to learn and I think there's decisions that I've made, you know, in the past that weren't, you know, the best decisions or I could have handled situations in, you know, a better way. And I wouldn't necessarily consider all of these things failures. I think they're shortcomings that help you learn on how you can do something better in the future. I mean, we've had tons of tons of challenges. I went through, you know, business partner buyout. Um, that wasn't a failure. That was just, you know, a challenge and a big bump in the road to, you know, decidual uh, was in a pretty big legal lawsuit over the brand name we've 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 definitely fallen flat on our face you know countless times but i think all those times we have made us stronger and helped us recognize you know what we need to do differently and if you don't fail you're not a human right you, you got to do it to succeed it's so important for for learning as well and and experimenting i would rather have our team fall flat on their face and not necessarily try I, if you truly believe in something, let's go for it. Let's figure it out. You know, we've done, we've tried to do things and, you know, they didn't necessarily work. Like uh, in 2020, we pivoted our business model, uh, not our business model. We took a brief pivot because we had no business. Q1 2020, everything stopped. We had 50 in full-time employees and we had customers didn't, that didn't want to buy. There was so much uncertainty. So we tried to figure out, you know, what do we do? We started, we launched a campaign called We Got This America. And the goal with this campaign was to, it. yeah, it was uh, the goal of this campaign was uh, to try to uh, be a, a breath of fresh air and so much negativity, and ultimately give small businesses a platform to help kind of fund themselves with these, you know, slogan T-shirts that you know said "We Got This America." We built a website, we launched a video, we uh, made product in a matter of a week. It was incredible how quickly the team rallied around this and. Looking back on it, I don't think it was, I don't think it was a failure, but it didn't meet the expectations that I think I originally anticipated. But I think what we had accomplished there was immense success. I think if, you know, some team members may look at it, they're like, oh, this wasn't a huge profitable opportunity. It didn't make us a ton of, you know, it, it didn't keep the lights on, which is what we were hoping it was, it was to do. But the learnings that we took away from that, I think are, are you know, priceless. It yeah. was such an incredible learning opportunity. You have this time after you make a mistake, you have to make a judgment call and you have to make it based on your experience. And if you have none, you have to just, you, you're kind of winging it to a certain extent. Tell me about those moments. And maybe, maybe it's the, the time has kind of shortened up a little bit from you have thinking and doing. So you have this time to process what happened and learn from it. Do you think you've gotten quicker at processing a mistake and then acting? I think it's, I think it's a lot quicker. I think we're good about understanding, um, I think we're, we, uh, we take a lean approach. Uh, you know, we try to, if we implement an idea, you know, we get, you know, our product launch or something like that. We try to get feedback and continuously uh, improve that, that product or that aspect that, you know, evolves it for the better, which helps us make decisions on whether or not we want to continue to move forward with something that may or may not be successful. Whereas I think before we would be like, oh yeah, we can do this. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, rather than, you know, recognizing, hey, this you know, may not be the best option for, we got this America. I think, you know, after probably two months or a month and a half, we recognized, Hey, we need to pull back on continuing to put a ton of resources into this. You know, it was an all team thing, but we recognized, Hey, this isn't getting the traction that we originally anticipated. We need to begin thinking about a new direction or assuming, you know, the similar direction that we were going prior to, you know, everything halting. We don't have to talk too much about the pandemic, but this hit at 10 years into you being a business owner. What, what are, is this like a, oh my God, I, you just never know what's going to happen. What, what was your mindset like at that point saying huge accomplishment? We made it 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do next? Yeah, oh man. We came into 2020 with huge growth goals. Uh, we, we were, you know, building the foundation to continue to grow. Um, I was, um, wanting to get to a place where I could not step back, but step into the, uh, the CEO role rather than be immersed in all these different facets, which I, you know, I feel like I, I had always kind of been sucked in to all these various things. So I was ultimately super excited for, you know, 2020, we were going to grow. I was going to step back. I was going to delegate and then literally got like punched in the face by COVID and I, it was overwhelming. It was like all the plans went out the window. You know, there isn't anything online that you can read about to kind of prepare for this. 
it was extremely challenging. I think that, um, I think 2020 was the hardest year um, for me mentally and emotionally, um, just the ups and downs, not just with the business, but I think the ups and downs that it put, you know, our team through and the fact that as a leader, you know, you're trying to shelter your team and, and do what's best for your team. To be honest, I had no idea what to do. And what I tried to do was was best. And looking back on it, I, I stand by everything that, you know, that we did and the decisions that I made. But all those decisions were extremely hard. It was extremely, it was, it was a challenging year. We, we came out super strong. We had a record quarter in Q4. Um, but Q1 and Q2, man, we went from 50 employees down to 14. And I think that was the hardest day I've ever had in my life because it's like, and, and a lot of those, you know, a handful of those people had been with us from the very beginning, you know, and we didn't know, I didn't know. It's like, are we going to be able to continue to, to maintain, you know, you only have so much cash. How long is that going to last? You know, we have uh, pretty extensive overhead costs. We do warehousing and fulfillment. So we have to maintain that component. And just to maintain that is an extremely costly thing. We just moved into a new office building and, you know, that was a, you know, a, a hefty expense. So it was tricky. It was a tricky year, but I think what was uh, what was cool is it was really inspiring to see how organizations pivoted. It was inspiring to see how organizations adapted. It was uplifting to see how we adapted, how we moved fast, and I think I think we accomplished more than we've ever accomplished in 2020. So as hard of a year as it was, I'm extremely thankful for it. What is it like inside the mind of a CEO to say we need to cut? X percentage of our employees and having this like this moral debate of something that is the necessity of the company to make sure that it continues forward, but is an incredibly hard decision. What like, tell me about your mindset in those moments where you have to make a really hard decision. What was that like for you? Um, Definitely super emotional. I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we have to do whatever we can do to preserve the organization. And, um, and even though that's what, you know, I know is the best thing and the things that, you know, we have to do, it's, I remember we would drag the, in 20, we, we drug the feet. It's like, we need to be making these cuts. We needed to, to make these cuts a week ago, but it was such a challenging thing to do. 2020 left me calloused, you know, from that. I think I have, uh, I, I've learned, learned a lot and <clears throat> I was fortunate <clears throat> enough to have a, uh, we had hired a, an HR a uh, person who is now our, our COO and <clears throat> she has has a ton of experience and she brought an, uh, an incredible perspective and helped out so much with that. I don't know what I would have done without her in, in 2020. So thankful, thankful for that. But you know, those conversations are super hard because it's as a business owner, you want um, to be able to provide for your team members. And when you're put up against a wall and you can't do anything, it's, it's challenging. I mean, I listen to those, you know, the podcasts from like Dan Price and stuff. He's like, I would never I would never lay off any of my employees. He has a, a unique uh, perspective, uh, but he also has a unique business. You know, he's, he has a tech company. He doesn't necessarily, you know, need to. It's his cash. I mean, I think you have to gauge the business. I, I think I listened to one of his things and he said that I think uh, leaders that have to lay off their employees are, are bad leaders. And I was like, I, I don't agree with that at all. I think if uh, uh, an owner is trying to lay off employees so they can get, you know, a better bonus or something like that, absolutely. That's not a good owner. They made a bad decision, you know, to hire that person. They need to stick with it and figure it out. But if, if you're, if the business is in jeopardy, I think you have to, you have to make those decisions. And part of that is this whole concept of radical candor, right? I don't know if you've read that book, but it's this concept that when you genuinely care about somebody, you're willing to have the tough conversation. And so in those moments where you have all this emotion going, you care a lot about this person, you want the best for them, you don't want to put anybody out. How important is that radical honesty or candor with that person to have that conversation? I think it's, I think it's super important to, you know, to help them understand what's going on and, and why you're doing what you're doing. And, and I think that's where you, you have to have that human element, yep. you know? Um, and I think our team, really understood why we had to do the things that we did. And we had an incredible team that, you know, was willing to work when they, when we couldn't afford to pay them to work. And, um, but I think, yeah, communicating it and, and, and um, helping team members understand why, why you're doing what you're doing is, is, is critical. 
And part of that's culture. And I know culture, <clears throat> culture has got to be one of the biggest corporate buzzwords of all time, but there is a really genuine, if you talk about it in, in the right way, it is a truly genuine and really meaningful thing. And I know that's been super huge for you guys because you have a lot of the same people that you started with. Tell me about your culture, ding, 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 corporate buzzword. But tell me about what your culture means to you. What, what is it? What is your culture? I think we have um, a very fun and positive and caring culture. Um, looking back at the beginning, I think it, it used to be super fun, like zero rules, like bring 18 dogs to the, uh, you know, to the warehouse, to the office, make sure, you know, of those 18 dogs, 10 of them are two week old puppies. It was everything Must. went. And yeah, and we, I mean, it, it, it was fun. But I think as as we we've grown and evolved as a as an organization, so as our culture, our culture is is growing up. But I believe Briss is uh, an extremely fun and caring place. You know, we we definitely grown and our culture is cha- like we are in the midst of culture change. Um, but I believe it's changing. It is changing for for the better. We we are growing up. We want to continue to grow. We have you know big objectives. That doesn't mean we want to we don't want to have fun. That just means hey we can't light fireworks inside on someone's birthday anymore. <laughs> you know that's that's a we recipe did that. for that's disaster. Amazing. Yeah. Yes, we we would do those things, and uh, we had so so much fun. We're gr- growing out of the, the that kind of stuff. Uh, but we still have a blast. We had an incredible virtual Christmas party. We have uh, some party planning planners that always, you know, make sure it's a, a good time. People feel cared about and people feel appreciated. And, uh, you know, we want it also to, to be a place where people can kind of let their guards down and uh, show their true self. Be comfortable bringing themselves <laughs> to the office or to the, mm-hmm. to the uh, factory. Um, happiness and money. This is like you know, you and I had the some, somewhat of this conversation when last time we talked and mm-hmm. you've got this scale of, yes, money is important for security. Money is important to give opportunities. And I think it sometimes get a bad, gets a bad rap and everything can't always be about happiness, but it can't always be about money. Well, tell me, what is your philosophy on the balance of happiness and money as a CEO and what, what you try to present to your, your team on, on, on your mindset on that? I think money doesn't create happiness. Looking back at, you know, wh- where we came from, I think, um, you know, we're, we're at an awesome place right now and making more money than I made five years ago, but I wouldn't say I'm necessarily more happy uh, than I was five years ago. I think, I think happiness, you know, for me stems from caring about what you do, caring about why you're doing it, caring about who you're doing it with. And I think that creates something that is, is worth more than any sort of amount of money. I think, you know, I think early on um, grow, I want Briss to grow. I want us to have impact. You know, we have, uh, we always have big, you know, revenue goals, but that revenue goal, that revenue driver, it's not necessarily, it's not about the money and it's not about, you know, the the net income that we're going to have at the end of the year. But to me, it's more so about the, you know, the experience and the value that we're providing our customers and the amount of products that we're getting out there. I don't know. I think if you can just be comfortable, I think you can be happy. And I think um, I think Dan Dan Price his his philosophy on trying to pay people um, a fair wage so they can be comfortable. I think that is a, an incredible starting point. So I think yeah. there's I think there's there's a balance there. You can't make anything, but you gotta you gotta be you know comfortable. Well, another balancing scale is <clears throat> hard work and luck, right? And some people don't believe in luck. Some people don't have to work hard. Um, and everything falls into their lap. But for you and your story, how much is, you know, just grinding it out and how much is maybe did you put yourself by working hard in the right opportunities where things happened and they seemed lucky, but they were just happening because of the hard work. What's your philosophy on that balance? I think in order to be successful, it takes a whole lot of grit and tenacity and not giving up. Um, I mean, sure, there's those anomalies out there that you know, may not work super hard, but are super successful. But I think, you know, 99% of the business owners out there, entrepreneurs are working their asses off. And I think because they're working their asses off, opportunities present themselves. And I think some people may think those opportunities are luck, but I think it's because of the hard work that they're putting in in is, you know, why. You could call those opportunities luck, but I think those opportunities come from, you know, the hard work. I think looking at, you know, all the things that we've been presented with, it's because we busted our ass for those things. 
you know, that's why those opportunities pre presented themselves. We had a huge customer come visit two years ago. We have, you know, our production facility is like not great. The walls are, you know, the classic 1970s beige. And we're like, we need to figure this out. We have this huge customer coming on Tuesday. We need to turn this place around. We drove to Ikea. We went to Home Depot team members painted the walls over the weekend. We turned this hideous place into a cool place and we got the deal. And it's because we worked, you know, the team worked their asses off to create a presentable environment that, you know, was well put together. And that's what created that opportunity. And you can say, oh, we got that, you know, that deal, that's, that's luck. But I think it's because of the hard work that we put in. Granted, at the start of the business, it's probably pretty lopsided between personal and business, right? You, you, you're, you're pouring so much, your energy, your money, your time into the business, but everybody's got a constant. Every, everybody's got something that when they do that, whether it's, you know, exercise or snowboarding or meditating or just being around people, or maybe they're introverted and don't want to be around people and that's their recharge. For you, through everything, through the growth of the business, through the pandemic, through everything, what, what has been your constant and your, your reset button so you can come back to the office energized and ready to help your team succeed? Um, staying active, whether that's, you know, working out, snowboarding, surfing. Uh, but, but that's something that I've, I've had to kind of work on. Um, I think for the longest time I, I would work, I always felt guilty if I wasn't working. I always felt like I needed to work and I never gave myself for the longest time. I wouldn't give myself the time to be able to recharge and the time to do those things that I needed. And it was, it was, it was probably about a year ago when I was like, this, this is so damn unhealthy. Things need to, things really need to change. And I finally have, you know, a solid routine that puts me in a good place to start the day. You know, I can tell when I don't do it. And um, if, if I haven't done something active for the day, I, I, it, it shows. So I think it's I think it's super critical to find that balance. And it's I think that is one of the biggest challenges that I've had throughout my entrepreneur career is finding that balance. I've always felt like I need to go, go, go. I always feel like I need to work, work, work. There always needs to be something to be done. At the end of the day, there's always going to be stuff to be done. But you have to be able to step back and realize, you know, there's other things that are that are more important, your sanity and, you know, mental well-being. And so what advice would you, so someone's starting, they want to start a business, a manufacturing business, a, a coffee shop, whatever industry it's in, what, what would be one nugget you could pass along to that person or those people from your successes and failures that if you could go back and talk to yourself 10 years ago, what would you say? I'd say build a habit, you know, build, build a routine and, and, and try to build a routine early on. I have, I have some friends that are starting businesses right now. And uh, one of them recently, you know, reached out to me and he's like, I'm, I'm struggling. All I do is work, work, work. And that's how he began. And I think it's, it's hard to break that habit. And I think one of the things that I would recommend, you know, at the beginning is, is try to set that balance, set a standard for what you expect that balance should be and try to maintain it. And uh, I think if you can do, do that early on, you're going to have probably a lot more happiness because you're not going to have to constantly combat, you know, the other side. Yep. It creates, creates balance because when you are building your business, there is no balance. You need to create structure and it's, it's a, it's an mm -hmm. absolute must. Um, what's the best way for people, you know, uh, businesses to contact you about um, working on their brand and, and getting apparel? Through our, our website. So bristmfg.com, uh, we're an end-to-end -end merchandise management solution. So we can cover creative design, obviously merchandise manufacturing, warehousing and fulfillment. And we also do web management. So the, guy, so the goal there is to allow some customers that want it to have a completely hands-off experience. Brennan, thank you so much for your time today and just sharing your vulnerable story and telling us about who you are. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Building Bellingham is a community podcast exploring leadership, challenges, failures, and business with entrepreneurs right here in Bellingham, Washington. You can watch interviews live and be the first to hear about upcoming guests on the Building Bellingham Facebook and Instagram pages. Again, I'm your host, Leo Cohen of the Cohen Group Northwest. This episode was produced and edited by Cooper Hansley and Tiffany Holden. Our logo was designed by Sam Vogt. To learn more about the team behind the podcast, search Cohen Group NW on Google, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn.